All right, let's get going, everybody. Welcome to Logic Live. My name is Andy. I'll be your host today. Uh, we have a wonderful episode lined up for you today. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with Will Harris and Jan Lafare of Autodesk. You know them, you love them. And uh, before we before we begin, let's just give a shout out to our friends at Cinesis Oceana who are sponsoring Logic Live. These guys are my own personal uh, reseller. I've been working with them for 15 years. We could not do what we do without them. And they're a huge supporter of, uh, of Logic and the Flame community. They host our, uh, our user groups in New York, but also user groups in Atlanta, Dallas, Chicago, Toronto, Detroit, and probably more. Um, if, uh, and they've also been huge supporters uh, of, uh, of like One Frame of White. They're always volunteering uh, prizes and uh, just a great bunch of guys. If you have any needs or questions, uh, definitely reach out to, uh, to the folks at Cinesis. Cinesis Oceana provides solutions to keep teams connected and working. Find out more about their remote workflow solutions at Cinesis.io. Cinesis Oceana, supporting Flame Artists since 1997. All right, there's everybody. So uh, I just want to welcome, first welcome Will and Jan to Logic Live. Hello guys, how are you doing? Hi Andy, doing great. Thanks for having us. Of course. Hi Andy. <laughs> nice to virtually see you again. Um, you know, I thought it would be great to, uh, to have you guys on and talk about uh, Flame and Flame development but you know, really take advantage of the time that we have uh, to kind of dive deep and, uh, and maybe just get a, a, a little bit more detail or go into a little bit more detail uh, about some of the, the things that come up either online or uh, in the forums or at the user groups. Um, but before we get too deep into, um, into uh, the nitty gritty, uh, I figured let's, uh, let's introduce the two of you to the, you know, to the rest of the crowd here. So, uh, starting with Will, uh, Will. I mean, I, I remember uh, meeting you at various, you know, uh, Flame events um, before you became the product manager. But tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and your journey. Sure. Yeah, Andy. Um, so I'm a, I'm British originally, but um, you in the been in the states for almost twenty years. Um, went went to university in Canterbury, England. Did a film TV program. Finished in '98, uh, <laughs> and then and then ended start started in the like the like a lot of people maybe is like a runner in the post business in London and worked my way through to to come into the states for a edit company called Media 100. If you remember those guys. Oh, I remember Media 100. Sure, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, and so I was like a tech support guy in the early 2000s. There became a demo guy, and I remember one of the sales reps there in Massachusetts said to me. Do you, what do you want to have on your resume? Do you want to have Worcester, Massachusetts, or do you want to have Los Angeles? And I was, and I was dreamy eyed right at that point and, and went out to LA and started showing off stuff and got to work for Keycode Media, the avid reseller in, the, in LA. And then, and then I'd heard of this thing, like what's better than avid was kind of, I was working my way up the ranks and and then I, that was about the time that I first heard of Flint and Flame and Fire. And then I remember once going to Riot Santa Monica and they had seven Onyxes, which is now like method, <laughs> in, like, like staring at each other like Iron Man and Hulkbuster um, <laughs> across the machine room. And I was like, oh, wow, this is a whole nother level. And it took me a few more years to finally get to work on that kind of gear at Company 3. I worked on uh, on the smokes on the Tezros, um, back to London to Frame Store to work in the DI department, and worked on Smoke Advanced again, and then back to LA and Laser Pacific and Luster for a little bit, and then finally I got the call from Dave Sampson at Autodesk, who was very much an old discreet guy. Hey, well, you know, come come and come and join us, and uh, and the first assignment was. Just learn that thing for six months, because um, I I didn't really know it very well. You know, you don't you don't as a junior and a kind of growing into, uh, I didn't know everything about it, and I just spent six months just learning the beast of flame, and and it kind of was all 
it was all areas of my career all came into one, right? I, I loved doing the 3D stuff. I did some of that in Avid DS. I loved, I loved uh, rendering, lighting, but I also liked, you know, online and color grading. And, and it all, it, so I arrived, I arrived at the mothership is how I felt. And that's how I became a demo guy for Autodesk, did that for seven years, did the trade show circuits. And then finally, um, uh, I'm not sure if you remember that the previous Flame product manager, a guy named uh, Charles, was actually killed tragically in an accident. And that was the time when I then started talking to Steve McNeil, who's our director of technology uh, on, the, on the, the Flame side. And we sort of started thinking, well, could this job be done remotely? Do I have to move to Montreal? Because <laughs> one, wonderful as it is, it was a big shock. Uh, we, I visit there a lot, but these days I actually live in Austin, Texas, and uh, go to Montreal a lot when, when the travel is allowed. But I get to work with, now these days I get to work with an amazing team of, of sort of combat seasoned professional developers, QA folks, and, and, and they're really a very special team, uh, the Flame team. And I'd love to talk more about that, but I won't go on forever. Go ahead. On to Yen. That's great. Uh, I, but I'm just so thrilled that there's a, you know, someone else to add to the list of, of, uh, of people who do a great Dave Sampson impression. You know, that's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's an elite group, I have to tell you. Yeah. What about you, Jan? Uh, well, I, I guess that my journey is way less sexy than Will, but yeah, well, here it is. Uh, so I'm, well, I guess you can hear it. I'm French Canadian, so English is not my mother language. So we can just clear it up now. Uh, I, so back in 98, I started a TV and film program. So that's where I started learning Flint at the time on an Octane. And then after that, uh, I spent a few years uh, in post working on some blockbusters like, uh, well, I was working at Hybrid, so I worked on the Spy Kids and uh, once upon a time in Mexico, so the, the Robert Rodriguez movie. And then I got the opportunity to join Autodesk in 2003 as a QA, so as a tester. And well, I guess that the rest, the rest is history. So I'm, I'm with Autodesk since 2003, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, the Pampers got a shout out in the chat, by the way. So yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's my sponsor. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I'll have to tell the folks it's innocent. <laughs> Wonderful. I didn't know you, uh, you were at Hybrid. I, I did uh, like three weeks there back in uh, 96 or 97, like when they were still in the house. Okay, you know? well, they were, yeah. So it was just a bit before my time. So I was there at, well, in uh, 20, well, from, from uh, 2001 to 2003. So, gotcha. Great group mm -hmm. of people. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you about about uh, um, about Flame. Where do you? How do you describe Flame to uh, to other people? Where do you see it in uh, in its? What is its place in the in the community and the ecosystem in the market? And that's to both of you, really. Well, uh, well, I guess that the best way to describe it is Flame is the Swiss Army knife, so it can do basically everything on the the uh the post ecosystem so that's the main strength so i think that will can probably just chime in and just add more meat on the bone but i guess that's that that's how i would describe it yeah it's i mean it's different things to, to different people right i mean to some people it's the greatest magic box of of creative freeform tricks and that's a definitely a you know part of it I love, and I love to see the, you know, the one frame of white crowd and the and the you know the Gabriel Garridos of the world and the stuff they come up with and the concepts, which are like super CG supervisor level things, um, and then to others it's you know it's it's the it's the Mac Daddy NLE machine right, and it's it's like Adobe Premiere and Avid and and some After Effects and some you know, nuke all in one. Um, and then there's, I mean, I just feel like there's other specializations um, and, it, and it all depends on where you, 
where you come from, right? I mean, we've seen people come from Avid DS, which was one of my backgrounds, and and really like uh, really like Flame in terms of its concepts of nesting nesting inside a shot, an odyssey of of a comp that is that is nested inside a timeline. Um, we've seen we see people um, uh, just just being pure conform conformistas, if you like that. They're their building picture for the biggest blockbuster movies um, and doing it at a level of precision like I saw when I worked at Company 3 uh, and others like, you know, the Technicolors and the Encores and the Molinaires in London that are, that are just like amazing at what they do in, as well. So that diversity, it, honestly, it's a blessing and a curse uh, to us <laughs> uh, because it's awesome. But it's also challenging when you come to have to prioritize, like how do we show something for everyone, let's say each year in the cycle of what we of what we do. You know, I, uh, before we dive into that, I, I want to go back to the team. How uh, how how many people are on the development team, and where are they located, and what do they do? So yeah, so so most of the team, uh, really all the actual developers are in Mont are in Montreal in the, the famous Ten Duke office. And you know the size the size varies based on projects. You know we've we've seen ebb and flow. Um, there's sometimes there are projects that are combined like with the Maya team or with the Shotgun team. Um, but we've kept like a yeah a real a solid core of a mixture of senior developers. Some of our developers are twenty year veterans just on Flame, um, and and a, a lot of new blood actually coming into the team in the last sort of five to seven years. We've We've had like interns come from you know the and the, the local universities that like McGill University where a lot of the the original developers came from there in Montreal, and we've you know, picked them up if you will as as interns and brought them in and and now they're you know writing the Python API in Flame or refactoring code of how. Please tell them I said thank you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we should Send do my love, please. <laughs> You should actually do another. You should do another live, maybe one day, bringing some of those individual, like you know, twenty-two-year-old developers that are like, yeah, I, I code for Flame, and that's what I do. <laughs> it's quite totally cool. Um, but so there's, so there's, so that's the that's that's all in the in the team, and uh, and it's a rich, it's a rich um, kind of ecosystem of developers uh, these days. I'm happy to say. What what would you say about about that, Yen? Well, as you said, uh, well, like the Flame community, I would say that the Flame development team, it's much like more a family than a working team. So we are all brothers and sisters. So yeah. that's the beauty of it. I love it. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, and we do sometimes argue like family. <laughs> you don't <laughs> talk politics at Thanksgiving, is that what you're saying? I was going to say, like, like creative, like you know, we 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 talk about the creative problems our customers have, and some of us are more tuned into different you know type of customer, and we have that whole philosophical discussion of you know how serious are we about this aspect, you know, this tracking or scene linear or color grading or, and we and we try to you know talk it out and balance it out, and I think you know I think maybe that that it creates the well-roundedness that hopefully we've achieved in this product. And how many people are on well the done team? Done in. Total? Re so, sorry, can you say that again, Andy? Yeah. How many uh, people are on the team in total? Well, let's see. So there's, I mean, there's, there's probably in total, I mean, there's, there's sort of, there's 35, 40 people involved in the developers, the QA. Um, and then if you extend that, you know, to sales marketing folks, you know, there's, there's, there's dozens more. Wow. Yeah. Gotcha. I'm sorry. What were you going to say, Jan? Well, I, I was saying that, well, sometimes we argue, but it's, all, it's always in respect and love. Ah, yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the, your, your process. So you just had a release uh, come, come to fruition, the 2021 release, like a, a couple of weeks ago, it seems. Um, that came out. When did that start? 
you know, how long is the development cycle? Tell me a little bit about the, I mean, I live in, in 30 second increments. I make commercials, you know, sometimes I work for a day and sometimes I work for a month. That's a really great question, Andy. And I'm glad you asked it because I think it's something that I, even as a demo guy for Autodesk did not understand the, the, the lead time and the planning period that goes into, let's say making a, an NAB major release. Because if you think about it, that's the very end of the process where you have to have a fully cooked, baked, out the oven, distributed to customers. You know, back in the day, would be burned on a, on a bunch of CDs and distributed. These days, it's a download that has to be uploaded you know, a few days before and then is trickled to users. Um, but that's just the very, very, very end. And if you start tracking backwards, you've got, you know, you've got a gold build that has to be finally stabilized, that has to have bugs fixed, that then has to, you know, I'm going backwards. There's a feature complete date, as we call it, which is where all the features have to be in and we start stabilizing and fixing and, and hardening the release. And that, you know, that's a whole kind of four to six weeks. We're four to six weeks back at this point, right? And then, and then the, the main development part could be three, four, five months. So then if you wind the clock back there, you're, you're, starting, you're starting coding features, maybe let's say October, right? And that, what that means is that you have to have planned what features you want to code in the, quite a lot of detail before that. So wind that clock there, back more to let's say July is where we have to be start the, the detailed planning process of what we want in the next April release. Well, wait a minute, you, you, in order to start detailed planning, you have to have all your prioritization and all, your, all of your kind of big blocks established. So that process probably starts as early as the previous April, NAB, Tech Taster, hello. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and, and then that feeds into a prioritization process so that by July, we can say, okay, we know we want to do these three things and these little things, let's say from play feed, playing feedback, and that's going to be the major release. Let's start planning. So the short answer to that question is it's almost a whole year, right? To from conception or like let's start a new a new piece of paper or a new a new Jira page <laughs> to say what is next year's release gonna be like. Almost a year to fully actually realizing that as a shipping piece of software. So so to come along as I did as a demo guy, let's say in February and say, oh, can you not do one more feature, guys? Like, that's just like connected conform. <laughs> <laughs> is, is a total, you know, it's, you're totally <laughs> off in terms of what you're asking for. I mean, if you're saying there's one little bug in, in feature X that I've played with for the last two months in beta that I know that you're just about to put the lid on, can you fix a, a bug in that? Yes, absolutely. Or can you nuance where the buttons are? Yes, that's a February question. But that, the question that, you know, can you have a new concept needs to be really a year earlier to actually be able to on-ramp into the, the full process. Now, that doesn't, you know, smaller things for sure, like going down the, feed, the flame feedback list and adding elbow nodes and being able to say, okay, well, there's a, you know, there's a, I wish we could add these more functions to the, to the Python API are oh, certainly things we can pick up late, but I didn't realize how early you have to add the big concepts in order to, to, to put it through the whole entire product, you know, the factory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about the big, the big concepts. How do you, um, how do you decide on specific features to develop? I mean, how, how much is, how much do you weigh in industry trends? And uh, I guess maybe a, another way to ask it is how much of it is planned and how much of it is a reaction to things that uh, you weren't expecting or you know, that the, the market has now said is the most important feature of all time. Right. I'm, I'm thinking just, 3D, I'm thinking stereoscopic, you know, specifically, you know. See what Tim Farrell just said about it's time to get the ball rolling on a new text module. That's right. Tim, um, you're late. We were expecting that somewhere around two minutes after two. So <laughs> thank you. But, but yeah, so, so to answer your question, it, it's a combination. It's a funnel of input that you have to take lots of different inputs into the funnel. Um, so, so for example, it's, it's, I mean, some of the inputs are naturally user groups. Those are kind of trusted 
consortiums of valued users where we really do take big, um, what would you call it, big, big takeaways from a user group um, that, that says we really favor this over this, like if they vote on something. Um, and we should talk more about like auto bucks maybe in a little bit, but that's one aspect for sure. Another aspect is industry trends, um, seeing, seeing the need for something, whether it was like you say, stereoscopic back in the day, the little bit before my time, but that I know that that was a big driver that sort of hijacked the flame release in, in the sort of summertime that led to the next spring. And that's good and bad, especially because you consider, you know, it, three years later, it may not have been that, you know, or maybe five years later, it was not so, so, so valuable, but there are still good things in there. VR is another trend that, you know, you could argue we could have responded more to. Uh, we were cautious. Um, and I think that ultimately that played out in our favor um, just because it could have been a massive derailment and you could have had nothing else kind of thing the following year if you're not careful. Um, but but so yeah, you're watching you're watching standards, you're watching HDR, um, watching you know um, the cloud. <laughs> we should talk about that as well. And then and then the other aspect, of course, is we're starting to understand more about our users through analytics. Um, so people that press the button that says we'll you know, share share information, it really does help the product because because we're able to see okay, well they import you know, certain codecs, they're, they're, we're able to understand what modules people spend the most time in and not, which is all, you know, anonymous data, but it really helps us to see, oh my goodness, no, no, one's, no one's using that codec. Why would we, and why do we need that kind of thing? Or it's, and find defunct areas of the software and that kind of stuff. So, so I would say that's another aspect that's, that's just kind of starting off is, is analytics as well. Gotcha. Yeah, you mentioned uh, you mentioned auto bucks. I don't know uh, how many of the. Let me let me just take a minute and explain that to uh, everyone else in the in the uh, in the audience. <laughs> um, a few years ago at NAB, you guys held an event called Auto Bucks, and you invited some users uh, to uh, kind of give some not only give some suggestions of features, but then assign like a a, a, a dollar value, a auto bucks value yeah. to them. I remember we all showed up. We were asked, you know, to pick our five favorite things we'd like to see developed, and it was great because I was sitting next to a colleague, and he had five completely different things than I did. We submitted those. We all went away. I think we had lunch. We came mm -hmm. back, and uh, those those feature requests were up on the wall with dollar values attached to them. Yeah, might have been ten dollars or fifty dollars or whatever, and we were each given a hundred, you know, auto bucks. And told, uh, okay, how much of this, you know, money would you like to assign to your favorite features? Uh, yeah. Why did you guys hold that event? I thought it was fantastic, but I'd like to hear from you what the the impetus was behind it. Yeah, I mean, it it really was like a focus group, um, like a, a Luma exercise. If you've heard of Luma, we use that. Um, and, and Jan here has been has been heavily involved in these from the beginning. Uh, we've done them all over the world, it seems like, haven't we, Jan? In Vegas a couple of times, London. Uh, we even did one as far back as like version 2015 um, for the in the in the kind of post anniversary recovery era. Um, and it really was, as Quinn was just saying there, um, a tough exercise in that kind of time frame. But but. Uh, but I think what it does is it serves to to help people understand the challenges and opportunities, I guess, in prioritization. Uh, a wise man once told me, pick three things, do them well, um, versus pick 10 things maybe and do them partly, <laughs> uh, which I think is good guidance. And I think that doing an order, a, a $100 test or a $100 investment test, when you have seven projects which are sixty dollars each and ten projects which are thirty dollars and three projects that are you know ten and, and fifteen that are that are ten or twenty bucks or whatever you then get to understand like okay you can have one or two big rocks this year and you can have a lot of little rocks what 
what makes a story? What makes a, a package that moves forward, let's say, the agenda of machine learning or the agenda of uh, tracking? Or, and and per, per release, it makes sense to kind of have some sort of focus or some kind of threads. But fundamentally, the order box exercise to me, and I'll let Yan jump in on this as well, gives us a, gives a, a kind of an, an empathy or an empathic way to do that prioritization together. And, and it helps people to just sort of say, oh, wow, so, you, so I can see now why you can't do, you know, rebuild paint and rebuild, um, you know, uh, rendering or uh, at the same time you have to pick one big rock otherwise you all of your energy is going to get split which will mean that you won't do either one well mm -hmm. what would you say about that yeah well i agree with you i think that the well there are two main purposes uh just for the uh the autobug exercise the first one is that it helps users to realize that their priorities may be totally dif different than the other users and i guess this is not something easy to understand when you are working in your shop the and the other thing i would say that it's important it's from a user standpoint it may be pretty hard to figure out the cost of implementing something something that you think it's pretty easy to implement may 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 turn to may, may turn to uh, into a lot of works at the end and a lot lot of development weeks and days. So uh, I guess that this exercise help users just to have a better understanding of the development constraint and the choice we have to make just development wise. Yeah, I also remember sitting next to uh, sitting in one of the tech teasers that that uh, that Will was holding and sitting next to a, a good friend who was uh, you know, Will showed up, it was one of those slides that said, you know, we can work on these 10 things, uh, pick two that you would like us to work on. And uh, I, I believe one of them was connected conform and another one was related to like deep compositing. And the person I was sitting next to had never conformed anything in their careers, uh, worked at a shop where they exclusively did shop-based work and uh, have a heavy nuke presence. So they were, it was totally into deep compositing. That's a phrase I had never heard before. I conform every single day. I'm doing it today, before and after this Logic Live session. And so I remember looking at him and going like, well, maybe this doesn't mean anything to you, but it means everything to me. And it was very clear to me at that point that, like you said, this is a product that, uh, that appeals to so many different people on very different levels. And sometimes it can be uh, a challenge to prioritize what you work on and when. Maybe you could have told him it was deep conforming. Oh, thank you. know what? Let me go see if that URL is available. Hold on. I think I, I think we, 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 we could all come out and hit this rich people. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you uh, about the, the, the shutdown, you know, um, I guess it was, it was in mid-March that, that we all shut down because of COVID-19. That was close to the end of a, of, a, of a cycle, of a release cycle. But if you guys could just tell me what has changed. I mean, tell me, of course, about you know, shutting down, but also what about the, you know, your process? Have you had to change um, what with all working remotely and, and, uh, and things like that? Yeah, I mean, we've... More Zoom meetings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah. Most, most seriously, well, I do not know if probably Will can, can chime here, but development-wise, it didn't change a lot of things. So we, we are a bit more restricted to hardware because, because basically most of our hardware is in the building, which we cannot access, get access now. But we, uh, apart from that, we can do mostly everything just remotely. So I don't believe it's going to affect the value of flame or diminish the, the, uh, the, the, the level, the quality level of the features in the future. So for us, it's probably a good thing. Yeah, it's been a learning experience for all of us, right? I mean, we've suddenly got all our developers and QAs working from home, some, some needing to literally kind of, the, the last day the, op the office is open, um, take, take home specific specialized pieces of equipment to be able to do their job. Um, 
uh, it's it's there's an anxiety level and a and a kind of a, what are we going to do and a, being able to sort of a few extra meetings to coordinate, which I'm sure you, you know, we've all experienced. Um, but but yeah, the technology in some ways enables this, right? I mean, we we build the actual flame build is is done in California, so they they were remoting onto Autodesk servers, you know, from Montreal, if you like, to build the to build the actual software on in our daily um you know debug builds um anyway uh they would it was never a, 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 a so it was been a long time since with a server down the hole where you could go and do a hard reboot <laughs> <laughs> if you would um anyway so and and i think that you know it's we've all had to find our way to be productive uh you know i've i've been working from home for a few years um but i've always known that you know um, Jan sit next, sits next to Louis, so I can count on that if I say something to Jan, I'll, Louis will know and, and that he can shout across the desk to Stefan Labrie and make sure that we're on for that meeting of that kind of stuff. That dynamic is not so easy now, right? And there's a, there's a like, like we were saying earlier, there's a creative kind of being together in the office and, and you know, I'd, I'd come into town for a week and we would all, we would all kind of do some deeper planning meetings. Um, um, quite regularly, but we've had to manage without that. Um, and we were planning to do one at the end of March, and we had to do it over Zoom. <laughs> uh, and uh, it may, yeah, these things these things get a little harder. I think it was kind of fortunate that we were near the end of the the release uh, in March. If this had happened to us in November or December, maybe where you know it's the core working time of a major release. It probably would have been. It could have had a much more impacts. Maybe delays. It's hard to say. Uh, are you thinking about, or have you had to change uh, your your roadmap in response to now everybody working from home, or that work working remotely is now a thing? It was a I, it was not, a trend. Now it's a thing. It, you know. Yeah, I, I hear you saying. I would say not in terms of capacity or ability to achieve. I think, like Ian was saying, we're. It's amazing how professional these these folks are in terms of they're still they're not saying we can only do 50 percent of the work we're looking at you know still doing full productivity uh but what is being injected into our prioritization is the is the industry trend of remote and cloud right and all the facets of that so we we'd already we'd already started to think about that over the last year or so um and we'd started to investigate well what is you know what does cloud uh, look like for for finishing and for you know high high speed interactive composting with a with a video preview? Do you need a video preview? Do you need audio and video in sync? <laughs> Those kind of questions. Um, and you know, even a year ago, there were some pretty big challenges, including customers that did not want to be on the internet <laughs> at all. Um, and Remember that. <laughs> things have changed. Yeah, things have changed quite dramatically, right? And then suddenly, um, in in like, if if you put chart back to like um, the HPA uh, meetup in uh, I think it was what early February, it was it was pretty clear that you know studios are really starting to take take cloud and remote workflows more seriously. And then come March, it's like we're starting to think, wow, you know, um, remote is coming at us fast. And then, and then cloud might well be considered not too long after. So, so we've really started to to factor that in. Um, it's still, it's still kind of, you know, it's still. I feel like it's still sort of baby steps in some ways. Where, you know, whether it's people operating over, you know, HP RGS or or um, any desk team viewer or you know, like a Teradici setup. Um, we've we've certainly tried to do some sort of quick reactions to that, uh, like the the early DKU for Sensor Seven Six. Yeah. Uh, but I think there's there's more to come, right? And and there's more concepts to think about in terms of remote reviewing, uh, being able to being able to to kind of connect to your flame from one location and then connect to it from another location, and then and then at what point do you start thinking about actually using a cloud data center? To host your flames maybe one day so that's kind of where we're we're at with that gotcha let me switch to some of the the questions that we're getting here from uh from yeah. 
from the audience. Um, here's one. Will we see Python 3 anytime soon? Yes, and I, I swear that we'll, wasn't from me. Well, we'll have to. I think. I mean, we'll 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 want to uh, uh, look at it. Um, hopefully, at some point next year. Yeah, uh, cool. and whilst others are, you know, bigger facilities, are, I'm sure struggling with making that change in lockstep with all their all their tools, not just Flame. Um, I can imagine, you know, smaller folks will just jump right on it. Gotcha. Um, could you explain uh, the, the, the situation with Luster? What's going on with Luster? Sure. Yeah, well, certainly, um, what, what a great product, first of all. Um, I use it in production. Um, and we, we ha I feel like we're still learning from Luster um, in terms of its, its speed and agility on, in certain ways. Um, and uh, I, I, would, I would then say that um, we've, We've had some various kind of uh, dances with what what we do with color grading in our, in the flame family. Um, and if you cast back uh, to if you think back to like 2016, we we launched this program called uh, this this project I guess called Connected Color Workflow, which was a way to jump across from Luster to Flame to do something and then jump back to Luster. And for some people, that that was pretty cool, because that would allow you to 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 go from a kind of color grading environment and step into uh, compositing for an hour and then and then come back, or maybe five minutes and come back, or an hour and come back. H however, what it wasn't was it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't fully integrated grading, and it wasn't integrated finishing. So at some point we we pivoted to say okay we have to pick a horse here, we have to pick whether we build compositing into Luster, <laughs> and maybe conform, and other things and floating point processing, or whether we start bringing some of those concepts that we know people need in Flame today and that was then and project forward to you know 2020 and 2023 what are they going to need. So we, we made a decision to start integrating color tools inside Flame. So, so today we're at this point where you know, perhaps we're 75% perhaps we're done, 80% done, how, how, how you rate it, where we're, we're building an alternate, really, an, an integrated grading experience inside of Flame that we think will, will, you know, will ultimately be our, our integrated solution. Um, there's it's certainly no problem. You, people are still using Luster, and still, uh, you know, loving its merits. And then, and then others are are growing and learning Flame as an integrated finishing tool. You know, people coming out of college these days and and are not seeing any boundaries between color grading and online and 3D modeling and lighting. It's all just one creative process of post or previous post or whatever way you want to look at it. Um, so that's, to me, that's the story of Luster and the surrounding initiatives. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I remember, I mean, I remember either, either one of the user groups we've had or some previous session, uh, the, you know, the question came up about, you know, integrating Luster with Flame, about having a Luster tab. And there were, I remember, I'm, I'm sure I'm paraphrasing, but one of your responses was, well, would you really want that? You know, would you really want just a tab or... Would you like something like, what are you really asking for? You know, like that kind yeah. of thing. And well, uh, I think when you, when, you, when you do those thought experiments, when you really think that out, it's, uh, it leads to better things. It leads to better, more productive, um, you know, right. evolved tools. I, I remember candidly, I mean, we, we launched like Connected Color Workflow and said, look, we added, we added a way to get to flame from inside Luster. And then I remember one person saying to me, I can't remember who they were, you've, you've done it inside out. We don't want that. We want we want color tools inside Flame. And in other words, we we conform here, we finish here. We want the middle part of the job to be like a super advanced version of Color Warper. And then when we start then saying, okay, well, what does that mean really? Does it mean that you just need a better color tool? And and the answer is yes. But we also need a new way of looking at the timeline that is more visual. Oh, so you mean you want a storyboard? Well, yes, kind of. <laughs> uh, 
and we want grouping and we want the ability to, um, you know, why would you limit yourself at just color effectors in, in the, uh, the shape system, right? Because it, if we, we could have built like a whole nother module that was exactly like cluster, but then you'd be limited in terms of that you couldn't use maybe, you know, uh, the keyer that you want in there, or you couldn't use a matchbox that you want in there. So we finally came to this kind of design philosophy of, it actually needs to be built from action. Uh, the action tool tailored to be, to be basically the most flexible color grading tool you ever had. And that's, and that's what sort of begot the image node or the image node, as we say in French. And that, and that is really kind of the, the core with the effects environment around it as a, as a concept. And we haven't, and by the, I'm looking at some of the other comments there, we haven't forgotten some of the higher uh, you know, productivity tools. Um, it just takes time. We have to go do an order box test uh, this afternoon <laughs> to figure out what, what order we should do it in, right? <laughs> we can Venmo you the auto box. Um, you know, one of the questions that comes up a lot or a topic that comes up a lot uh, on Logic, and we, we even had it in one of our Logic live sessions here is, you know, I need to buy a machine for home or I need to buy a machine. Do I get a Mac or I get a Linux machine? Mac or Linux, Mac or Linux. And the conversation starts usually with, you know, something at, at a higher level and then it quickly descends into, um, you know, like what, what either doesn't work on Mac or what works better on Linux. I, want, since I wanted to ask you guys, what, um, why, why are there differences between Mac and, and, and the Windows versions of, of the software? And uh, maybe just dive into that a little bit. So the Windows, I guess you you meant Linux. Oh, I'm right? sorry, I meant Linux. Yes, there's a so, huge well, difference between the Mac and the Windows version. Yeah, well, the Windows. thing is that well, I was just wondering if it was a trap or or not. But, uh, uh, well, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 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 the thing is that I, I well when when someone asked me the question if I should go with Linux or Mac, I always reflect and just say, you, you have to think of your needs. So if you need to run multiple application on the same box, I guess the solution is probably is likely a Mac compared to Linux because it's much easier uh, to, uh, to, to install multiple application. If you want a full powerful system Flame dedicated, maybe you can venture into Linux. So you, you have to think about what you need first. Uh, but feature wise, well, I guess that the main difference between Mac and Linux is the graphics board. So on Linux, the availability of a more powerful graphics board uh, is there compared to Mac. So, and that has always been basically the, the main difference between both operation, uh, operating systems. So on Linux, you can get a much more cap, uh, graf, uh, capable graphics board compared to Linux. The thing is that with the new Mac Pro, this, well, I, I would say that the gap between Mac and Linux is much more smaller in regards to graphics board than it used to be. So Will, Will do, you, do you want to add something? Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I mean, we, we were all kind of waiting to see how the Mac Pro planned, uh, panned out. It seems to be kind of impressing people. Um, there's the whole aspect of convenience and like I said, third party, um, not needing much system engineering help on the Mac side that certainly seems to attract people to Mac. Um, the, uh, I mean, there's, I think it's worth saying that we're more likely to see Linux in the cloud and over remote versus Mac. That's an interesting factor. Um, uh, and why I, is that? It's, it's mainly, I think it uh, might come down to, you, know, you don't see Apple forming a big cloud presence. Um, and as a kind of a, a high-end IT kind of platform, the, 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 the open sourceness of Linux has probably been attractive. Um, I mean, you, you've seen, <laughs> I see people saying, well, yeah, you can use, you can use your Mac for the cloud by having a viewer that is a, a an AWS Linux machine on your MacBook Pro, <laughs> right? So that's not really Mac. 
Um, uh, so, so there's some interesting dynamics going on there. I, I would quickly follow up with um, that we don't deliberately um, want to restrict anything on the Mac. Um, we've, there's been some restrictions like hardware anti-aliasing, um, the way that shaders are computed, you know, the way substance works, the way um, the, the match boxes or more like the actual kind of rendering engine of action has to be tailored a little bit differently on the Mac. So we pay a little tax. We have to kind of, you know, we have to make it work on Macs and Linux. And, and that's, and I don't mean in terms of slowing down Linux. I mean, in terms of we have to adjust it so that it works well on Mac as well. And that's the tax. Um, but I think it's worth it because I think that's a growth area. I think people that are coming to Flame new are picking Mac overall. Uh, and uh, and even if they graduate into a super duper crazy Linux machine after two years, I'm, that's okay. And they can go back to Mac again when they start their own post house and they don't have an engineer to help them. You know, I think there's a whole di whole bunch of dynamics there. Um, but but like I mean, the world of the world of more powerful Macs is now starting to emerge. I would yeah. You know, I, I think we just have to prioritize. You know, what could we do to optimize that? Um, and take advantage of those that hardware, along with all the other priorities that we want to try and do. <laughs> you know, sure. And I, I would also say that the well, sorry, sorry, Andy. I, I, I would also say that the portable aspect is important here because yeah. a lot of users, freelancers, need to to run Flame on different just computers. So run it on a laptop, move it, let's say, on uh, use it on set, and so on. So, and well, this is, I would say that Mac OS is more the platform of choice for those type of users now compared to Linux. So that's probably another incentive just to go to Linux if, if you need a portable system. Mm -hmm. So keeping the product yeah. the same in terms of like being able to archive back and forth is important, I think. Being able to keep the features and where the buttons are and the experience the same is something that, you know, Require is required for that. Totally. Um, there's been a lot of chatter uh, lately about uh, a Windows version. Sorry, Jan. It was there was it wasn't a trap, but it was it was an implied trap. Um, we know that, that it was coming. I know. I know. It isn't like you haven't seen it written, you know, <laughs> all over. Um, talk to me about that. Is that something that's a, um, is that something that's in in the cards if 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 not what what are some of the challenges to to taking on uh you know a third platform i guess um i i i let me i'll uh, i'll jump in there and you should you can you can give us some real facts how's that yeah <laughs> <laughs> not alternate alternate facts <laughs> uh well from my point of view as um, like if you think about it on the business side um, it's a question of what is the biggest thing that could impact Flame in the long term positively, right? What, if you had a magic wand or a big pot of money, what would you want to do? And, and that's when maybe the conversation comes up. Retire. Because, yeah, right. <laughs> but that's when you might ask that, uh, how big is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow if you were to start a three-year project that was a, a Windows port? because because whilst you know, whilst we're, you might say, is it is it really that big? Well, Flame is big, right? It's millions of lines of code. It's got a lot of network dependencies. It's got a lot of uh, different ways of calling hardware. It's not like porting a a small app or a web, you know, a database. It's it's like it's a it's a monster. Um, so it is a big project. So you can, if you can trust us on that, then the question is, okay, well, is that a, is it significant enough of a, a, a addressable market on the other end um or are there other things that you could do to to achieve the same amount of growth that maybe are you know incremental or outside of software development like an educational program could that be more impactful than than porting to windows or um or would you know some crazy marketing campaign or um, adding features that go after Nuke or Resolve, or is is there is there you know is there more incremental ways to to achieve something significant? So that's 
that's always the 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 kind of dichotomy of of the windows argument for me mm -hmm. would it add to more users i mean I, I could see that that was the conversation about you know doing the mac version you know yeah no, i think that that was a natural step uh and if you remember back to november 2015 that was flame unleashed where we we kind of put our foot in the water with with smoke with flare with flame assist and then eventually uh, flame and along with that came the change of business model where it was no longer uh, a turnkey system but also but now a, you know a software product which which makes it more palatable to a big company like Autodesk that sells software right and that's another factor that you need to to kind of put into the world here is is what makes sense for the company and the business model and are they are they able to to invest in education or you know, go, going after a competitor. There's a lot of dynamics. <laughs> and much as, much as I wish I could take on something as big as adding windows, it probably, it seems too big to, to give enough results. Gotcha. Jan, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, well, I, I think that my take on this is that, well, we, we all understand, and I guess you agree that, going to windows or porting flame to windows is not going to please any of the current flame users right it's probably something that would attract new flame users the thing well the counterpart is that it's going to take it, it's going well it would take a significant amount of of development time and resources to, to get there so 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 we we have to keep that in mind to say that well would our users just accept to to the flame team just to put some initiative on pause while we are just doing something for future users or do we should the well one one uh, so so i guess that the, the use well the question we have to ask is guess is that does a user want to do the user want us to work on what is meaningful for their workflow now or just on something that would attract other users and that's the question we have to ask us so that's that's my take on it Gotcha. Yeah, um, the, the, it's a tricky one, Andy. Um, hopefully, that we gave you a reasonable answer. Um, there are there, maybe it's worth quickly saying that there are other like architectural initiatives that we are working on, trying to um, modernize in terms of the way we address hardware. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of um, the language of OpenGL uh, that has been you know the historical way of uh, addressing graphics cards since the '80s. Uh, that flame was very much built on, but how it's it's being you know it's ultimately the new generation of of technology to address uh, GPU compute is starting to come in uh, through things like Vulkan for Linux and Windows, but and Metal for Apple. So so that's an area where you know maybe there could be some more incremental um, investment and and see see a nice growth over time in what we could do with the hardware. Gotcha. Um, 3D tracking. One of the questions here points out that uh, 3D tracking has been in the number one position on Flame Feedback for about three years. And are you working on it? That's a very good question. And I'm not at liberty to say at this point. <laughs> That's but, good, man. We went 57 but, minutes without that. So that <laughs> I got to um, cheers to everyone. But, but I wanted to say that I, I acknowledge it's been a number one. Um, I'd like to point out that um, uh, a, a defocus tool, like a physical defocus type thing, was up there as well. And hopefully that you've seen some movement on that. That came out of old, uh, Tech Taster and Autobucks uh, consortiums. Um, but we have, not, we have not ignored uh, the, the, the desire uh, for, for improved uh, camera solving and tracking. And I think that all I'd like to say is that I think when you think about machine learning and the cool stuff that is happening with machine learning, it, it really hit me like about, I don't know, six months or a year ago that, you know, is there going to be a new generation of camera solvers that, that are kind of machine learning enabled? And would it be worth some sort of research, some sort of understanding? to not just rebuild a, a PF track or a 3D equalizer, but, but see if there's options out there to do something more automated. 
Um, and I'm not sure if other, other, uh, other companies are thinking the same way, but I'm just saying that it's, it's one area where machine learning could, you know, could actually help us ultimately. We're, we're not sure yet, but we're, we're certainly, you know, I'm certainly something to, something to think of. Mm -hmm. uh, just a couple more, couple more questions for you. Um, what about the threat from, from uh, competitors that give things away for free? I know that that was always a challenge. I remember that it was, was uh, very explicitly brought up about, uh, about like Resolve versus uh, Luster. Now it's very difficult sometimes to compete against a, a competitor who's giving it away, you know. Yeah, no, that's, that's an interesting how do, you, how do you combat that? In, in a word, the way to beat free for me is workflow. In other words, if you have a better workflow, then you should be turning away a free product. They should be paying you to use it if, if it makes a, for a slower workflow. Um, but if you, if you have, and the, the real value comes in, if you can provide a workflow that, that, that is just better. Um, and, then, um, and then I would also point out that the costs of the software have not, are not the biggest piece in a business's um, you know, costing anymore, right? It's got to be the the talent and the space, or maybe maybe that changes with you know, work from home. But but the individual talents should be and are the biggest cost and the biggest uh, producer of mm -hmm. stuff. The software ultimately is kind of has come down to a point where it's a tool, like owning a laptop or you know buying a, the right TV or whatever, uh, versus it being the room. Uh, or the the the, main, the biggest expense. So so I think that helps. What do you think? Could you name a couple of uh, of, of trends or new technologies yeah. that uh, either you're excited about or you're thinking about or might find well, its way into our favorite app? I think we're still we're still in the kind of spotty teenage era of machine learning. Uh, there's another another level of maturity. Those were great years. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> I <hope> people come. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm imagining that you'll start to see kind of AI stuff, um, not in a scary way, but in a good way, find its way into all kinds of tools um, and maybe have more phases and breakthroughs as a trend. Um, we, we're, like we talked about earlier, we're still just waiting to see um, the, the longer term impacts of, of remote to cloud. I mean, are, are CEOs and business owners going to, acknowledge, wow, if we can remote into our office, why don't we remote into a data center that's a few blocks away and then four wall our office and remote into the data center and have the office be just another remote site? I mean, I think that's a, a, a possible trend. Um, I still think um, HDR is still kind of coming, coming along. I, I feel like we'll see more and more content uh, done that way more easily as tools get easier. Um, and, and I think HDR and VFX might be another trend that we'll see people being able to monitor it earlier on in the pipeline. Uh, um, other than that, I think, I think we're just going to see more pressure on, um, tools to be more productive, whether it's more automated tracking tools, um, roto isolation, I can see that becoming more and more pressure as, as there's, you know, kind of one person do it all on their home, home machine and produce a product, a project. Uh, those are going to be pressures that I think will also squeeze out of the current era. Cool. There's one more question left in the Q and a before we sign off. And it's uh, just about atomize. Uh, there was a, <clears throat> there was a feature developed atomize. What was the impetus for, um, for it, and did it have any further trajectory than where it has landed? Wow, let's think. I mean, that, that's that's a good old one. It's it was a cool technique. Um, it gave us some kind of interesting particle-like things, but it definitely had some limits. You couldn't, you couldn't. It wasn't really a true three D particle system. Um, and I mean, I'd see it as kind of a an interesting foray of like the matchbox technologies. Um, I, I don't, I don't know of any, I don't think we have any other, other big plans for it, to be honest with you. Gotcha. Does that, oh, oh, I was about to ask, does anyone have any more questions and boom, ah, oh, man. Will you had to say particle system. We almost got through this without particles. 
<laughs> so yep. um, Sinan asks, um, particle system? It's, uh, that's one of those ones where, imagine we had an order box exercise where you, you had to pick, um, and you could only get one big rock in your $100, and those two big rocks were camera tracking or particles. Uh, that's exactly the kind of, the, of kind of either or situation that we run into. And it'd be interesting to, to, to know if, how this room, this virtual room would vote between the two. Would they, would they, would they go tracking or would they go um, uh, particles? I'm not sure, maybe. I'm trying to see if I can do a quick poll. poll. <laughs> oh, there's one. Yeah, we'll do it on logic. Oh, hey, they're coming in. Neither. <laughs> oh, here we go. Boom. Forest particles via OFX, that's Quinn, that's right. It is, it works. Yeah, particle illusion as an OFX works with its limits, but, oh, coloring keys, camera tracking. <laughs> They're coming. Asking you shall curious. receive. There's a lot of tracking in there. Okay, well, I think the trackings might have it. Oh, wait. Brooks Tomlinson, Another same part. particles. <laughs> ML camera tracking, someone likes that. Text, really tracking, lens distortion workflows, part of camera tracking. I see from, all right. So you can see the, you can see the, like, <laughs> the kind of flurry of, uh, of stuff. Um, even Simon said camera tracking, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Yeah, but, awesome. but it is challenging, and hopefully that's that's I mean that's that's laid bare here that that there's there's a, we're never short of of good ideas. It's just a matter of time, and resources, and planning, and packaging. Okay, we need to do that, but we also need to you know update the red codec and the Ari support and this new camera and we're we're so we're always going to come out with seven new cameras next week. So, and that's all part of having a having a product in an ecosystem, right? That has to go together. Mm -hmm. Totally. So, so that's the, that's the rub. Love it. Well, Will and Jan, thank you so much for uh, giving us your time today. And we really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I have always been amazed at, at, uh, at how much of your time you guys give to the community. And I uh, just wanted to thank you very much for that. Very welcome. We can also so thank you, Andy, for, for everything you do for this community. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure, man. Thank you. These things have been I've great. Been I've, been, I've been learning stuff. The, I've gone back and watching videos, and it's, it's, it's been a real, really cool initiative that you've got here, Andy. Yeah. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who's given such great feedback about these. It's really been, uh, it's really been great to hear the feedback. Um, so let's close this out for today. If anybody, of course, has any other questions for the guys, you can, you can reach them uh, on Logic. You can reach them at the area. Please uh, make sure to give your, uh, make your suggestions on Flame Feedback. Um, we have uh, upcoming Logic Live sessions next Sunday, May 24th. We're going to do Maya for Flame Artists with Yuri Tempolsky. Fantastic artist. Definitely tune in for that. Uh, May 31st, Connect and Conform for Social Deliverables, which I am doing today <laughs> cool. uh, with Brian Bailey. So um, I'm definitely going to have questions for Brian come May 31st. June 7th, we're going to do Silhouette Paint with Boris FX. Oh, there's a lot and of and on June 14th, Resolve for Flame Artists with David Johns. As always, you can find this and other past episodes of Logic Live on Logic.tv, and it looks like this. And please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And thank you again to Synesis Oceana, our sponsor. We couldn't do what we do without the reseller community. So thank you. Synesis Oceana provides solutions to keep teams connected and working. Find out more about their remote workflow solutions at synesis.io. Synesis Oceana supporting flame artists since 1997. That's going to do it for Logic Live today. Thank you, everybody. And we will see you next week.